Hey, Aloha and Aloha Tuesday. Stan the Energy Man here. Stan Osterman coming to you live and direct from Kailua, Hawaii. My background, though, is off of Waikiki, a beautiful sunset in Waikiki. So it's a great time to get away from that snow and come to visit Hawaii. Today's show is a solo show with just me um, because I need to get caught up on a lot of what's been going on around the world in hydrogen. But I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about, you know, what's going on in Europe uh, with, with um, everything in Ukraine and a little bit of the energy implications there. So I've got some notes from my friend Dan Goen, and uh, I've taken a couple of his, and I'm just going to comment on a few of them. Uh, number one, when the U.S. started to impose sanctions on, on Russia for sitting next to Ukraine and trying to keep them from invading, we basically applied sanctions except for one major sanction that just went into effect this week with great pressure, I think, from the American community, which was to stop buying oil from Russia. Russia, its main export is oil. It produces around 8% of the, the world's oil, and it sells mostly to Europe, but it also sells oil and natural gas to the European Union and the U.S. and a couple other countries to boot. The problem with that is if we stop buying oil from Russia, we have to start producing more here. And the problem is that the shale oil and the the pipeline, the the um, the um, pipeline that we shut off uh, last year, Keystone Pipeline, stopped us from producing gasoline and stuff from our our or what we call organic uh, oil resources in the U.S. And now that we've now sanctioned Russia and we're not buying oil from them, we are definitely going to have a shortage of oil and gas for us. Um, because number one, shale oil and the other oils and other refinery can't just ramp up like you turn a switch and it ramps up like you're turning your light switch on. It takes a lot to get it going. So we, we've kind of got ourselves in what we call square corner with energy in, in the United States, but so does Europe. Europe actually depends on Russia for so much oil that being that the NATO and the European Union are essentially um wedded at the hip um it makes it makes it tough to just let sanctions do what they're doing and therefore we got what we kind of expected which was vladimir putin to roll into ukraine because he considers that part of mother russia so not all all oil is created equal either the oil that comes out of russia is is not the quality that we we um expect or we'd like to use but neither is shale oil Shale oil is not really good for a lot of applications and is not the best. Sometimes Russian oil is better than the, the fracking, fracking oil that we get. Plus, there's a shortage of the sand that we use in the fracking process. So there's just a lot going on in the world that uh, we didn't really anticipate with um, what was going on in Russia and what other countries are doing to maneuver politically on the world stage. And we need to do a better job of that. So anyway, one little fact that I think most people don't realize is that OPEC, which is about a dozen different countries, mostly um, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, and Iran, <clears throat> control about four-fifths of all of the oil produced in the, and all the reserves that we have in the world of oil and natural gas. And just those three countries, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Venezuela, control about 80% of that four-fifths. So, um, you know, they're, they're a big player here, and we've managed to tick off Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Venezuela, all three of them. So good luck trying to get more oil from them. On the good news side, the Department of Energy announced uh, a couple months ago that they're, offer, they're putting out what we call a RFI, a request for information, on a couple of key topics that have to do with hydrogen. So we're leading into the hydrogen news from around the world. We're starting off with something called energy hubs. The Department of Energy has just extended the deadline. It was originally March 8th, but they've just extended the deadline to the Hydrogen Hubs Implementation Strategy RFI. Um, it's going to be extended to March 21st of this year um, by two in the afternoon Pacific time. And it basically uh, allows states or regions to put together um, a conglomerate to tell the federal government how they would use federal money to help implement hydrogen um, 
uh, energy into their infrastructure and their economy to help the transportation sector and to help uh, the grid. Another um, bundle of money that's part of the same law actually um, is a response to the Clean Hydrogen Manufacturing and Recycling and Electrolysis RFI. It's still it's uh, still open until March 29th, and it's kind of a sister application to go with that um, that other uh, hydrogen RFI that the Department of Energy put out. Another just tidbit here is um, something I picked up from the internet: hydrogen generation could become a one trillion dollar a year market, according to Goldman Sachs. Now. That's really important because I don't think people understand that the world and the energy sector is really moving out big time worldwide from Australia to Europe to, to Asia um, in hydrogen. And if we don't wake up to that, we're gonna be behind the power curve. The US is already behind the power curve and it's actually this um, hydrogen um, hub system that's being uh, put out there by the Department of Energy is one of the best things that that the, the Biden administration has ever done. And I don't think he even mentioned it in his uh, State of the Union address. So we've got some stories here from the, from Keith Malone, my friend in California, just a couple of stories from the California Fuel Cell Partnerships. Um, speaking of hydrogen hubs, there's an, a memorandum of understanding between Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and New Mexico. And they're putting together a proposal for a hydrogen hub in that region. Colorado, the, high, the headline says, Colorado joins three other Rocky Mountain states to push for a regional hydrogen hub. And out of Santa Fe, New Mexico, the governor, Michelle Lawan Grissom, on Thursday joined governors of Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming in announcing that they will be uh, competing jointly for a, a portion of the $8 billion allocated by the Department of Energy in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act to, for the development of regional clean hydrogen hubs. These states are uniquely situated to become a clean hydrogen hub given the presence of high quality wind, solar, biomass, natural gas, and other natural energy resources. So that's the main part of the story, but I have to ask the questions. How many airlines, international airlines get refueled in those states? Um, not as many as have come through Hawaii. So I'll start the question now. Why isn't Hawaii being considered an energy hub? And to show this isn't a surprise, in the end of January, I asked Andy Marsh, the head of Plug Power, if he thought Hawaii would be a good hydrogen hub. And he advised me that he's already talking to our congressional delegation about becoming a hydrogen hub. So we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about that um, near the end of the program. Some other news from around the world. Um, I reported that Airbus announced that last year it will be selling hydrogen-powered commercial aircraft by 2035. That means they'll be selling them. That means they'll be producing them probably by the end of this decade. This year, they announced that they're actually dedicating one of their 300 series wide, wide body jets just to do testing on hydrogen power plants with a number of different um, hydrogen companies that are putting out aviation uh, engines, whether they be electric engines or, or engines that burn hydrogen in some form or another, whether it be liquid hydrogen or ammonia. And so they've dedicated an entire airframe, a big, a big airframe that they could sell for some big bucks to develop these, um, these systems. And it's actually an extra engine mount that goes on the fuselage. And so it's, it's a regular airplane, but they can put all their data collecting equipment inside the, the body of the airplane. And the engine is actually sitting outside on the top left side of the airplane off of its own little nacelle. Uh, there's also a study that was released by the Advanced Power and Energy Program and Computational Environmental Sciences Lab out of UC Irvine, which talk, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I'm just going to talk about a couple of the highlights. Um, it was made to, to do an assessment of the greenhouse gases that are episodic air quality uh, and public health benefits regarding fuel cell electrification at major port complexes. So basically, if you're not familiar with port operations, especially in LA and, and um, Long Beach, they service, as you probably heard in the news, hundreds and hundreds of ships every year. And they have thousands and thousands of containers coming off of those ships that are moved by diesel trucks. And they have a huge air quality issue in LA and that area because of these operations. So there's been quite a bit of work done to introduce hydrogen fuel cell uh, buses, or not buses, but uh, transport trucks. They call them drayage trucks 
to move containers around at the ports. There's also a lot of studies going on um, on maritime hydrogen because one of the largest greenhouse gas producers uh, of carbon, carbon dioxide and, and other um, NOx and other particulates are ocean going vessels. They, they count for about 8% of all of the pollution that's out there from transportation just by themselves. And of course, everything moves on the ocean pretty much, even including other oil. So fuel cell electrification at a port helps uh, attain air quality improvements, which we already knew. And then ocean going vessels and diesel trucks, they say should be targeted first for transition to hydrogen fuel cells. And that makes a lot of sense because like I say, you could do a lot better efficiency wise and to clean up the environment if these ocean going vessels switch to hydrogen power because they require an awful lot of energy to move those huge ships through the water. Water is not a compressible uh, gas like air is. So it's really tough to get a ship going that's heavyweight through that water. And the trucks, if you try to make electric trucks um, using batteries and try and haul heavy cargo, you can only go maybe a couple hundred miles before you have to stop and recharge your batteries. So if you put enough batteries in a truck to give it a, any kind of range, then all of a sudden you can't carry any cargo because you're carrying batteries and it offsets the cargo that you're allowed to carry on highways. So it's quite a balancing act that we have to do. And that's why this, this, um, this uh, study showed that we, we need to work on heavy diesel trucks and ocean going vessels first, that's a priority. Um, Chevron, Iwatani announces agreement to build 30 hydrogen filling stations in California. There's already about 50 stations there. The target is 100 stations, and this is another 30 that's just being done by Chevron and this Japanese company, Iwatani Corporation of America. Um, they announced the agree in their agreement to build 30 fueling stations by 2026 in California. And as part of the agreement, Chevron plans to fund the construction of the sites, which are expected to be located at, at Chevron branded retail locations across the state, which makes it kind of convenient, whether you need gas or whether you need um, uh, hydrogen. So the stations will initially fuel light duty vehicles while also returning, retaining the flexibility to service heavy duty vehicles, like I said, those heavy trucks over the long term. Iwatani will operate, maintain the hydrogen fueling sites and provide hydrogen supply and transportation logistics services. Chevron plans to supply a portion of the fueling sites with excess hydrogen production capacity um, at its Richmond's Richmond refinery and future hydrogen production from its pilot projects in Northern California. Um, there's a bunch of news from the, Cal the um, Ohio Fuel Cell Coalition. The, um, there is an interview with GenCell, which is an Israeli company that targets remote power applications with ammonia fuel cells. Um, most people don't realize that ammonia is, is a really good way to, to store hydrogen because um, it's very hydrogen rich um, ammonia can be used also for fertilizer, so it's it's real popular in agriculture. In fact, it's required in agriculture, but it's also a good way to have a liquid fuel that's really stable and not super cold like liquid hydrogen with just about uh, about a quarter less of the energy by, by weight, but it gives you an awful lot. So ammonia is used in fuel cells, could spur the energy uh, development of low carbon distributed power generation as hydrogen infrastructure develops. That's like for grids and stuff. So GenCell CEO, Rami Reshefs, has told Standards & Poor's Global Platts in an interview on February 8th that the Israeli-based uh, company is manufacturing alkaline fuel cells that run on ammonia using a catalyst to strip the hydrogen from the ammonia for off-grid and backup power generation. That's kind of their specialty at, at GenCell. This approach means customers can tap a ready supply of fuel for low carbon distribution and generation that already competes with diesel on a total cost of ownership basis. Now, that's saying diesel's at four something a, a gallon. I can tell you right now, diesel's gonna be way above $4 and something a gallon this year based on the, what's going on in the world. So that's telling you that already hydrogen is cheaper without a bunch of subsidies than diesel fuel is with subsidies. The next story comes uh, to us from Money Control, and it's from the Adani Group 
is in a pact with Ballard. Uh, they're a fuel cell manufacturing company to manufacture hydrogen fuel cells in India. Billionaire Gautam Adani led Ani Group has signed a non-binding pact with um, Ballard Power Systems to evaluate the joint venture for investment in commercial production of hydrogen fuel cells for various mobility and industrial applications in India. <clears throat> As per the memorandum of understanding, both parties will examine various options to cooperate, including the potential collaboration for fuel cell manufacturing in India. Adani Enterprises newly formed arm, the Adani New Industries Limited, um, ANIL, will be uh, housing the group's green hydrogen initiatives. Our ability to build a world-class green hydrogen value chain will be critical in facilitating the energy transitions. We are ex excited to be partnering with Ballard, a global leader in the fuel cell technology to create a share of the fuel cell ecosystem in India. We will be deploying innovative uses, use cases across our hydrogen businesses with fuel cell trucks, mining equipment, marine vessels, off-road vehicles, and critical industrial power, said Venit S. Jian, director of Adani's new Industrial Limited. Um, next story is consortium developing hy flat hydrogen storage solutions for fuel cell vehicles, flat high store. This comes from Green Car Congress. BMW uh, AG Robert Bosch uh, from Test Tini Key Engineering uh, and Hexagon um, Purus are working together in a research and advanced development of an innovative hydrogen storage system solution for fuel cell passenger vehicles. The project called Flat High Store, functional design and testing for an innovative hydrogen tank system with a total projected budget of 6 million euros has been granted funding by the German BM BMWI Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. The aim of the project is to develop an advanced hydrogen storage system solution for the flat space of light duty car underbodies that are usually intended for integration of battery modules uh, in battery electric vehicles. So in case you're not aware, battery electric vehicles generally have like a big flat um, space underneath the seats that runs almost the full length of the passenger cab with nothing but batteries. And they're looking to put all that into hydrogen storage, which actually, if they can pull it off, will probably give your hydrogen vehicle, you know, a thousand mile range with a single fill up of hydrogen. I'm sure they're not advertising that yet, but I, I know that's their goal. Okay, next story is fueling a hydrogen revolution from Science Daily. Scientists from the Graduate School of Systems and, and Information Engineering at the University of um, Tsukuba uh, in Japan are introducing a new technique for de detecting when a hydrogen fuel cell is experiencing reduced efficiency due to periods of excess insufficient water. So they're developing new sensors for the, for the fuel cells, again, to make them more efficient. Next story is, will hydrogen trucks power the supply chain of the future by energy monitor? And like I said before, I would say yes. The world supply chains are in crisis. Plummeting demand in 2020 uh, with lockdowns followed by booming demand after the economic recovery of 2021 has blown up our just-in-time uh, supply system. And the news is filled with vessels queuing up in the ports in, uh, on the East Coast but with empty freight containers stacking up on the shore and nobody to take them away. It's not just the maritime sector. Uh, road and freight supply chains have also been in a perfect storm of COVID-19 restrictions. Driver shortages and drastic fuel prices increase, warned the International Labor Organization at the end of the year. So their point being that if we could get these trucks on hydrogen fuel, they would be moving, keeping the ports cleaner, and we would they wouldn't have all the restrictions that the current diesel trucks have in the ports when they're operating. And that would help alleviate the supply problems that we have. Um, the next story, um, kind of reeks of critical analysis um, to me. You know, I, that's one of my 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 key um, peeves when I look at different projects. This one is a, a story, but I kind of take exception that it's a, a good news story, but I'm gonna read it anyway. A new sustainable way to make hydrogen for fuel cells and fertilizers is uh, is has been discovered. And this is out of uh, PHYS org. P -H -Y -S -Org. 
A new sustainable and practical method for producing hydrogen from water has been discovered by a team of researchers at the Riken Center for Sustainable Resources in Japan. Um, I won't mention any names, but anyway, I, I was really interested in this until I got to the point where it says that the new system uses um, can be can make fertilizers and hydrogen producing co using cobalt and manganese, and it says two fairly common metals. Well, they're fairly common, except that cobalt is one of the key elements in a good number of lithium batteries, and the world supply is is literally limited to less than two decades. So I don't see how you can make batteries for all the cars and trucks and buses and ships and planes and cell phones and computers and everything else and still use this in their technology to somehow make hydrogen cheaper. So I'm not even going to finish the rest of the story. It was a good idea. Um, unfortunately, you got to look at your source of, of materials, and unless they don't use hardly any cobalt, it's probably not going to work too well. Uh, it says light could boost performance of fuel cells, lithium batteries, and other devices out of MIT News. Engineers from MIT and Kyushu University in Japan have demonstrated for the first time uh, how light can be used to improve the performance of lithium batteries, fuel cells, and other devices. So we got to keep our eye on that. Extreme E, the fuel cell electric vehicle charging station of the future is here from Clean Technica. Extreme E is a brainchild of Formula E founder Alejandro Agog. Formula E launched an uh, FIA sanctioned showcase for a new cutting edge battery electric vehicle technology. An extreme version is intended to demonstrate the ability of an electric SUV to handle any conditions that mother nature can throw at it. The inhibiting factor would be how to stage EV charging stations in remote locations with grid connections not available or on site wind and solar generation with, with battery type energy storage as one option. And the military is among those exploring, exploring that avenue. Extreme E went another route and settled on a hydrogen fuel cell um, and Clean Technica uh, caught wind of Extreme E's fuel cell energy EV uh, charging venture at the time and is looking at it for a series they're gonna produce in 2021. So back to hydrogen hubs, DOE issued two RFIs, as I mentioned earlier, with the, um, with the law, the, um, the, uh, the law that they're putting out for $9.5 billion total in clean energy. This is from Ohio Fuel Cell Cons Consortium again. US Department of Energy released two requests for information to collect feedback from stakeholders to inform the Im implementation and design of regional hydrogen hubs and electrolysis and clean hydrogen manufacturing and recycling programs across the United States for the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA, representing a combined $9.5 billion investment. So the government's got the money, the bills are out there. So what's Hawaii doing? So Hawaii has been a fueling stop for ocean going transportation for over a century. And Hawaii is in a remarkable position to boost its own economy from an energy importing economy to an energy exporting economy like never before. If our leadership could just get their heads around hydrogen's clean energy potential, like so much the rest of the world is, you can't wait just like you can't do something tomorrow and expect it to happen instantly. Ocean shipping is one of the major greenhouse gas offenders. Major studies tell us that Hawaii could be a serious producer of green hydrogen and has been a lead, leading the way in clean transportation, ground, ocean, and air for forever. If we were a hydrogen hub, we could make this a reality, an economic boost to our economy. We can't keep kicking this issue down the road. I've personally briefed both of Hawaii senators and a lot of our legislators and governors but neither our state nor our congressional leadership seems to be able to connect the dots. Why are we competing, co competing for a, a hydrogen hub? Why aren't we competing for a hydrogen hub? Like I mentioned, I, when I interviewed Andy Marsh in January on this show, he was all for it and said he, he actually encouraged Hawaii to become a hydrogen hub. Another thing, one of our very own ThinkTech hosts, Kali Yakina, and the Grassroot Institute pleaded once again with our federal government to get relief from the Jones Act, which hobbles Hawaii's economy by forcing us to use US built ships and crews going between US ports. 
Hawaii buys Russian oil, or at least it did until this week, because of the Jones Act, because it's too expensive to, to bring in U.S. oil because we have to wait and stage with American-owned ships and crews. But the Jones Act stifles more than importing energy. It also stifles exporting energy, like hydrogen to the mainland. Why do we continue to do this ourselves? Our businesses struggle. Our tourism takes hits from COVID as our costs increase across the board with inflation. Our leaders refuse to look at important issues holding us back economically and socially. Hawaii can make all the green hydrogen we need for our ground transportation, our grid storage, and then supply cargo ships, airliners, and even export hydrogen, that all that they want. But true to form, our leadership will wait until it's too late and then try and find the most expensive solution and claim it's not their fault. Why, why, why? It's always been this way in my home state. Please, for goodness sakes, wake up. It's time for Hawaii to get serious about hydrogen. It's time for Hawaii to become a hydrogen hub. And our leadership needs to get on this right now. And that's my point for this week's Stan Energy Man. And I hope that everyone can really understand the kind of difference that not importing all of our energy for transportation and for our electric grid, how much of a huge difference that will make for our state. It will be a game changer you can't even begin to comprehend. The money that we spend, send out of our state and just basically throw away when that could be jobs in Hawaii, it could be careers for our kids when they come out of college. It's mind boggling. And yet we keep refusing to do it because we're looking for short-term gains and short-term profits and short-term solutions. And we need to be taking the long-term look, the critical thinking analysis that I keep talking about, and we need to put Hawaii on the map as a hydrogen hub. So please, Governor, please, legislature, please, congressional delegation, let's get going on Hawaii as a hydrogen hub. And that'll do it for Stan the Energy Man this week. Until next week, Tuesday, Stan Osterman signing off. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.